Right. So, uh, so before I start, I really have to uh, acknowledge the people who have organized this, this workshop. Uh, the Spice Center folks, uh, led by Cairo Sinova, but uh, Elena did a lot of work for this workshop and all the rest uh, from the Spice team here. And what I'd like to em uh, emphasize and acknowledge is it's not just this workshop. Uh, these guys are running workshops pretty much every other month. So they do a fantastic service uh, to the community. And for this specific workshop, <clears throat> I also uh, have to acknowledge the co-organizers uh, from Japan, uh, Hideo Ono and Shusuke Fukami, who uh, helped uh, to put the program together. So <clears throat> the workshop is, uh, is about antiferromagnetic spintronics from topology uh, to neuromorphics. Uh, Jairo <laughs> uh, just mentioned that I will give an overview of the latest developments. I will definitely not now give you an overview of the latest developments because you guys will give us in these three and a half days the overview of the latest developments. Instead, what I'll try to do is <clears throat> to uh, present the field from a, a little broader perspective. And uh, <clears throat> I will not do it in the order from topology to neuromorphics, but I'll do it in the reverse order. I'll start from uh, uh, an IT information technology context, the neuromorphic context, and then in the end uh, get to some uh, really elementary remarks on symmetry and topology and relationship to antiferromagnets. <clears throat> So starting from uh, the information technology perspective, currently we live in an era of big data. Uh, it's everything is about data. And when you look at this now, uh, the amount of data that is created is really growing exponentially. And we start to measure uh, data in zeta bytes. I had to Google uh, <laughs> to understand what that uni unit really means. And it's a, uh, it's, uh, is a gigabyte of terabyte or 10 to 9 of terabytes. <clears throat> and it's growing at an incredible pace here. <clears throat> so one thing that is very important uh, to have to be able to handle uh, this big data is storage. You have to have a, a good place for, uh, for storing all, all the, uh, the information. And <clears throat> here for us, as a, as a community that is rooted in, in, in magnetism and spintronics, I think it's very nice to see that still uh, magnetism plays a very important role in data storage. <clears throat> uh, we have uh, huge capacity magnetic tapes, uh, a large and very affordable capacity in, in hard drives. And all these technologies are still very viable today thanks to spintronics. Uh, uh, it's both the tape recorders and, uh, uh, and hard disk drives, they have these spintronic read hats. <clears throat> But of course, uh, 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 semiconductors are becoming more and more important. And uh, uh, the latest developments in, uh, in flash, uh, NAND uh, SSDs are really, really impressive in terms of, of the capacity here. <clears throat> if you think of uh, the other technology for uh, storing data, <clears throat> which was uh, really revolutionary in the 80s or late 70s and 80s to 90s, optical disks here, you might feel that uh, optical recording is kind of falling behind uh, uh, magnetic and, and semiconductor storage technologies. But one thing that I like to <clears throat> remind us is that uh, optical recording is still uh, around, even if we don't talk directly about optical disks, but just hard drives now. The latest generation of hard disks is in fact using a combination of magnetic recording and optical recording. There is a laser uh, that is assisting uh, the uh, uh, writing magnetic data on the drive. So <clears throat> it's definitely uh, optical means of recordings are definitely still uh, going to be around, uh, not only for these uh, 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 technical purposes, but also uh, because light <coughs> is the means through which we want to test the ultimate limits in energy efficiency of, of storing information and speed. <clears throat> so I'm going to also mention in this talk, uh, 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 recording not only electrical, um, by electrical means, but also uh, optics. <clears throat> so this is storage. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> uh, the, other, uh, the uh, other important thing which you have to do with that and now, because you have big data, is to have uh, meaningful means of processing the data, making some sense of the huge amount of data that uh, is now being generated. <clears throat> and uh, uh, what becomes more and more important is moving from the conventional ways of computing 
uh, into artificial neural networks. And there are uh, two uh, distinct principles uh, to uh, developing artificial neural networks uh, or neural networks in, in, in general. And the first one <coughs> is uh, what is called artificial uh, neural networks. And here on this cartoon, I try to summarize the two uh, key ingredients uh, uh, about artificial uh, neural networks. So imagine here that <coughs> what you want to do is recognize a pattern, uh, an image. So uh, what you do in this approach is that you uh, uh, make, make a pixel representation of the image and you arrange those pixels in a, in a vector format here. So those, those would be your uh, input values or if you want your input uh, neurons here. <coughs> And then you want to be able to recognize this image so this vector should somehow point into an output neuron which represents the image of, uh, of a digit eight. <clears throat> and how it's done in, in a neuromorphics is that there are these uh, uh, vectors of weights here, these, these red ones. And if the network is properly trained, then those, uh, the values on those weights would represent some mean uh, image or mean representation of the digit eight. So now when you multiply the input, which represents one sp specific realization of the digit eight with these inputs, you multiply it with those weights, Ws, which represent an average, uh, uh, um, an average image of digit eight here, you will have a, 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 a large dot product uh, output of this. <clears throat> Uh, because the components of these two vectors have a significant overlap. <clears throat> and so this way uh, you will be able to uh, recognize that this image uh, represents the digit eight. <clears throat> so uh, uh, the question is then how do you train the network uh, to recognize these images is that you start with some random values of these Ws, these, these weights, <clears throat> and then uh, when you uh, <clears throat> present this neuro, uh, neural network with an image, uh, you will see what happens. You do this, this weighted sum or this dot product, you get the result, and if the resulting uh, <coughs> value here, uh, <clears throat> uh, you look what is the product of the result and the input value. And if the product has a large value, that means that these two are connected, this input neuron and this output neuron has a strong connection, and so you strengthen the weight. So you change the weight uh, to be stronger. <clears throat> If they are not correlated, if this product is small, you, you weaken the weight. So, uh, <clears throat> so in this way, you have a very uh, quick and efficient means how to uh, recognize, for example, images. And what you notice here is that actually the math, uh, uh, the, algeb uh, the algebra is very simple. The only things that you need to know is how to do products and sums. <clears throat> and uh, then how is this implemented in computers? You can still use, and people still use, uh, uh, the traditional ways of, uh, of computer <coughs> architecture where you have these inputs and these uh, weights stored in a, in a computer memory here. And the, uh, the weighted sum here, or the dot product, is performed in, in processor. Uh, but as you see here, it's uh, <coughs> uh, uh, the traditional computers which would have a very uh, complex uh, central processing units which can do many different mathematical operations, it's actually an overkill because you just need to be able to do uh, products and, and sums here. <clears throat> uh, and uh, also conventional computers have only a few cores in, in CPU which means that they can only do a few operations in parallel. But what is needed for a neuromorphics is that you do a very simple operations, but you do many of them in parallel because you do this pixel by pixel uh, multiplication and also you want to present your network to uh, huge amounts of images. So uh, what is needed for, uh, <clears throat> uh, for this artificial neural networks is not uh, the best performing CPU or processor, but to have uh, uh, the stuff as parallel as possible. And so that's why GPUs which have 2,000 uh, medium cores uh, are now heavily, being heavily used for uh, performing this neuromorphic operations and that's actually uh, been the, uh, uh, the technology behind the great success of image recognition language translations that we've seen in the past few years. <clears throat> and and uh, uh, Google recognized the importance of uh, doing things in parallel 
and develop its own uh, uh, new processor, which is called a tensor processing unit here, uh, which has even more cores, about 30,000 cores. But those are really now very small cores. They can do just the, the dot product uh, sum. And uh, they are even in single precision, which, because it's enough uh, for doing this uh, very simple mathematical operation. But what they focus on is to have very fast uh, and uh, uh, very large memories, because what you need to do is really to uh, have your computer ready uh, to do this for uh, uh, a huge amounts of input data and for these parameters here. <clears throat> uh, so uh, in all this, whether it's CPU, GPU, or TPU, this is still uh, a conventional uh, standard computer architecture where everything is run synchronously under the common clock, memory, and processor here. <clears throat> uh, but what you saw here in the hierarchy from GPU, from CPU to GPU and the TPUs, is that uh, less and less attention is paid to the processor, which is really changing uh, uh, the, the way how we perceive computers. Before, everything was focusing on making as powerful processor as possible. Now we see that the processor itself is not so important. What is really important is memory. And uh, <coughs> uh, people started uh, thinking that, uh, why don't we then do the simple computation inside the memory circuit? Because the main bottleneck uh, for, uh, uh, for artificial neural networks is actually the, the, uh, the connection, the wires that are connecting, the buses that are connecting memory and processor. This is where you lose time, but more importantly, you lose energy. <clears throat> so why not uh, trying to make circuits where this is a, uh, this is a memory circuit, these are memory elements, and simultaneously, they will perform uh, the logical operation here. <clears throat> so uh, here, the inputs would be the voltages in this, Kir in this Kirchhoff's uh, mesh here. And uh, the conductivities of these uh, devices will be the weights here. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, what you see here, that just by using the simple Kirchhoff's law, if you uh, present this uh, network, the input voltages, with those conductivities in the end, uh, you will just sum them up and you will get the output currents which will be representing exactly this uh, dot product or the, the weighted sum here. So uh, it's a network in which it's, uh, it's, it, it's a circuit of memory elements but that circuit can already perform exactly the mathematical, the simple mathematical operation that is needed for artificial neural networks. <clears throat> so now the question is what kind of memory elements would fit the best, uh, this approach. So let's take a look at uh, what is available now in terms of uh, computer uh, uh, memory technologies. <clears throat> and uh, what we see here is that uh, uh, we have obviously the, uh, the volatile semiconductor memories, the DRAMs and the uh, embedded SRAMs uh, memories here. Uh, but uh, what would be very nice is to have some other alternatives. Alternatives that are, first of all, also non-volatile, like the storage uh, media here. And uh, also memories that will provide more than just two values. Because if they were supposed to represent those weights in our artificial neural networks, it would be very good to have multi-level state uh, uh, memories. So first, uh, the non-volatile part here, uh, we now have two uh, front runners, uh, uh, alternatives to semiconductor memories. Uh, one is a, a ferromagnetic magnetic random access memory here. And this is the phase change uh, random access memory. And if you wonder why these two technologies based on ferromagnets or uh, based on phase change uh, materials are really the front runners, I think it's because they are both based on something which has been already developed for uh, 50 years or, or maybe 40 years in, in, uh, in the optical storage case. So the phase change memory, it's a solid state memory recently introduced by Intel, but it uses the same material basis as the optical disks. Uh, and hard disk and, and magnetic random access memories here uh, uh, use a ferromagnetic material just as uh, magnetic hard drives. <clears throat> But these two guys are not the only ones. They, they are the only ones which are considered or which are now trying to complement or maybe later replace uh, main computer memories in computers. But there are also uh, other uh, non-volatile memory technologies which have commercial products. Maybe not in the main computer memories, maybe just in simple EEPROMs here, 
but they are uh, on the market. And they are these conductive bridge or these resistive uh, random access memories. And what these guys are based on is uh, <coughs> unlike phase change memory where you change the structure from, uh, uh, from uh, crystalline to amorphous, here what you are doing, you are controlling uh, the position of impurities in your memory channel. You're sending impurities, whether they are metallic ions or oxygen ions, in and out the channel uh, that is conducting current in your, in your memory device. And by this, you control whether it's high or low resistive state. So we have these uh, non-CMOS resistive memory alternatives to uh, semiconductor memories. And what you see here, all of them are resistive. So basically, you store the information in the memory in the change of their conductivity or resistivity. So uh, they're automatically very well suited for making these logic in memory type of devices. So let me now just give you uh, a very quick uh, uh, snapshot of what can be done uh, in these multi-level memories. So here is an example of a, of a phase change memory here, where you see uh, that you can control uh, the resistive state of this memory uh, going towards the higher resistive state or going towards the lower resistive states. That means higher resistive state mean more towards the amorphous phase and lower uh, resistive states more towards the crystalline phase here. <clears throat> and this is controlled basically by delivering energy or heat into the system uh, and controlling uh, whether while you delivered the heat pulse after the pulse, the system went to the crystalline phase or to the amorphous phase. So basically the switching is unipolar. You do not have to change the direction of the writing current. You just write in the same direction and just control uh, the amount of energy that you deliver to the system. Then we have the, uh, the ferromagnetic based uh, 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 memories here. And also here you can see that they can uh, store more than two bits uh, in the memory element. And the operating principle here is that you are switching those ferromagnetic domains one by one. Or if you want, uh, there is a one type of ferromagnetic domain and it increases in a gradual manner as you keep uh, pulsing the memory. <clears throat> so in this way, you can store uh, multiple states. And then the switching in this case is bipolar because for one current orientation, you're preferring one type of uh, ferromagnetic domain and for the opposite, current orientation, you are preferring the opposite uh, ferromagnetic domain. <clears throat> then uh, when we talk about these, these resistive uh, devices, they are also bipolar because for one current direction, you're pushing the impurities into the channel, making it more conductive. And for the opposite direction of the writing current, you're actually pushing the impurities back from the channel and make it more resistive. And as you see, you can also do this in a gradual manner. So you can store more than two states, you can store multiple states. And here, the, uh, the last example I want to show is a multi-level antiferromagnetic memory. Uh, and in antiferromagnets, in principle, you can do also this type of multi-level recording that you progressively switch more and more of uh, antiferromagnetic domains. But there is another principle which I wanted to highlight here that you can have multi-level switching in magnets when you have may maybe just a single domain, but you have more than one easy access. So that you can switch uh, your ferromagnetic or, or anti-ferromagnetic system maybe in a single domain state, but when the order parameter is pointing in a metastable or stable state in different uh, crystal directions. So uh, here is an example of a realization of such a multi-level uh, anti-ferromagnetic memory using this ferrite insulating uh, antiferromagnet and platinum on top. Uh, <clears throat> in the beginning, I mentioned light. Uh, so we can control all these memory devices, or virtually all these memory devices, not only by uh, electrical pulses, but also with optical pulses. And as I mentioned, this is also very important scientifically because with optics, you can deliver ultra short pulses. So you can test what is the shortest reaction time of your uh, memory technology. And also uh, by this, uh, you can test uh, uh, the, the ultimate energy efficiency because obviously when you uh, make your pulse shorter, uh, uh, you should spend less energy for writing. And again here, uh, I'm showing that uh, in virtually all these technologies, you can do also optical writing. So this is phase change memory. Uh, where you can just deliver instead of the heating current pulses, you deliver heating laser pulses 
uh, to control the switching between the crystalline and the uh, amorphous phase here. <clears throat> uh, uh, it's uh, in the electrical counterpart, it was unipolar. And that means uh, for the optical recording, you don't have to control the polarization of the light. So it's polarization independent uh, switching. What you just control is the intensity of the laser or the, uh, the length uh, of the pulses. Uh, and ferromagnets, uh, you can also, and here, as you see, you can also do the multi-level switching, where you pulse it multiple times and your memory level increases gradually. <clears throat> the same can be realized in, in ferromagnetic memories, where, again, you progressively change the, the volume of one of the domain uh, with respect to the opposite domain here. And again, you can also do it with laser pulses. But in ferromagnets, we really want to control the direction of the magnetic angular momentum. So in current switching, we had to do it by changing the direction of the electrical current. What we do in optical recording now, we control uh, the direction of switching by changing the circular polarization of the optical pulses. Because circular polarization contains an information about angular momentum. So for one circular polarization, one domain will be preferred. For the opposite circular polarization, the opposite domain is preferred. Now, for the resistive uh, memories, I could not find any optical recording uh, uh, papers or research. And I think it's quite understandable because here, electrical pulsing works. Basically, you are just shifting by applying electrical voltage, these ions back and forth. And it's hard to imagine how you would do that optically controlling the directionality of those charged ions in their motion through the, uh, through the uh, channel of the, of the memory. So these are probably not useful for, uh, <coughs> for optical recording, but antiferromagnets certainly are. <coughs> so in, uh, in antiferromagnets, when you do optical recording, you can also do, again, the same principle. You would progressively switch more and more of, these antiferrom of one type of antiferromagnetic domains with respect to another type. Uh, but what has been recently identified as another potential uh, switching principle, which works particularly well, could, could work particularly well in antiferromagnets, is to have some sort of a hybrid between a magnetic memory and a phase change memory, where you control the resistive state by changing the, uh, the type of domain structure that you have. Let's say in the ultimate uh, limits, changing it from a single domain into uh, a texture of, uh, of a nanoscale domains in your system. <clears throat> uh, and so this one would then, in analogy to the phase change memory, represent the distance state. And now, uh, uh, <clears throat> because you are not controlling in this switching the, let's say, net direction of your uh, magnetic order parameter here, uh, this type of switching can be also polarization independent, just like in the case of the phase change memory. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, in terms of neuromorphics, I introduced the first principle, which is called uh, uh, the, uh, the artificial neural networks, and which, from the point of view of uh, architecture of computers, you can still imagine the standard computers with a memory and with a processor, or with logic being inside the memory, but all in a synchronous uh, way running under the common clock. <laughs> the second principle of uh, developing uh, neural networks is uh, the so-called spiking neural networks, uh, which, as far as I know, there are no commercial products in this uh, 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 type of neural networks, but they are really heavily explored both on the, in the CMOS world, but also in our non-CMOS world. So first, one slide about the basic differences or basic principle about the spiking neural network. They are different from the uh, synchronous ones uh, in that they now work with individual spikes which are asynchronous, which means that uh, neurons, input or output neurons, they uh, emit or receive spikes basically at random times whenever uh, the, uh, uh, the value of, uh, on, a, on a specific neuron uh, crosses a certain threshold, this neuron will fire uh, a spike, uh, an impulse, current impulse, uh, independent of the clock uh, or of the firing events on the remaining uh, uh, neurons. <clears throat> and uh, this is believed to be one of the reasons why the human brain is so energy efficient. Uh, because using this asynchronous way where you only spend energy when you emit or receive spike, and you don't spend energy on every cycle of your processor or, or your memory, is the way how to save energy. 
And uh, there are two uh, basic principles uh, of the operation. One is analogous to, uh, to the, the weighted sum that we saw in the artificial neural network. But here, what the neuron does is the so-called leaky sum and fire. Leaky means that uh, there is an input spike uh, coming to this neuron, and now it depends on the delay between two spikes whether the level on the neuron will increase or not. If the delay is too large, then in fact, because of the leaky character, uh, the neuron will forget about the fact that there was a pulse long time before and its value will not increase. Only when the spikes are uh, uh, closely separated in time, then the level on the neuron will increase, eventually passing a threshold and firing. And the other one is the learning. Uh, how does the learning work in spiking neural networks? Here, uh, what matters is the time uh, a separation between uh, a firing of a post neuron here and the pulse uh, from the pre neuron. So the question is whether the pulse from the incoming neuron here, whether in time, is correlated with the pulse that is uh, 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 that is generated by this. Uh, uh, by this uh, post neuron here. So if the two pulses are not very far apart in time, the network thinks that they are correlated and it will strengthen the, the synaptic weight here. But if the two pulses are far apart, the network thinks that they are not correlated and then uh, the weight will not be increased here. <clears throat> uh, in, uh, in CMOS, there are realizations of these spike in neural networks. There are even uh, large integrated circuits uh, but I think they are still mostly uh, experimental. And what they use here, so this is the, the big difference from the, from the standard architecture of computers here, that the individual components of, on these integrated circuits are not anymore processors and memories, but they do represent the individual components of, uh, uh, of, a, of a neuron. So we have this uh, uh, leaky sum and fire, which is represented by a capacitor here, and then we have a synapse, and in synapse, in, in, the digi in the CMOS circuit, the synapse is, is really outsourced and it's usually represented by an SRAM here uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, different values uh, for the synaptic weight here. So the question is whether with our non-CMOS uh, technologies, we can do some, some alternative representation of the leaky sum of a neuron. And also if we can do a, a, a more realistic representation of the spiking time-dependent learning of the synapse. And so again, here is just an example uh, that uh, there are first attempts to do this in all these kinds of memories, phase change, ferromagnetic, resistive, and also in antiferromagnetic. So here, uh, what you see is this spiking time-dependent plasticity function of a synapse here, and this is the leaky sum and fire neuron. <clears throat> and the principle is how these uh, devices operate because they have to get somehow the time dependence in the game here. And so there are two ways how to do it. One is to use transient heating. So basically the first pulse heats your device, and when your device is, uh, has a higher temperature, so it's at higher temperature, it's easier for the next pulse to switch the device. So you see that there is a timing dependence on the performance of your device. There is a dependence between the separation uh, of the two pulses here. So this is used in these two examples. And the other way how to get somehow local clock or time in the performance of your device is relaxation. If you uh, if you're set your uh, memory state and then your memory state relaxes, then it depends what is the delay or what is the time between the two successive pulses. Because if the delay is too large, then the, the signal from the first pulse has already relaxed, so the next pulse starts from the beginning. But if the separation is not very uh, large, then these two signals start to add up, and you have the leaky sum. And as I, as I showed here, in all these uh, technologies, you have representations of, of these uh, spiking functionalities here. Uh, <coughs> You probably noticed that when I was doing this overview and the, this uh, uh, <coughs> looking at, uh, at, at magnetic and antiferromagnetic systems from this broader perspective, I didn't attempt to compare which one is better and which one is worse. Because if you go to the memory stiff community, resistive RAM community, if you go to the phase change community, if you go to MRAM community, people would always give you arguments why their technology is, is better than the other one. But it's, there's a multiple uh, parameter space, and you can always pick a parameter in which you would be better than your competitors. 
But the question is whether this is the key parameter and how about the other parameters? Are you also outperforming the competitors in the other ones? And I think you know, the jury is still out there and the message for me at least is that OR are very legitimate candidates to explore uh, for neuromorphic computings. And for us, for the magnetic community here, I think you know, uh, magnetic devices have a lot to contribute here. But there is certainly not uh, a time now to to make a clean statement that one uh, uh, type of technology clearly outperforms the other one. <clears throat> uh, uh, when it comes to comparison, there is, however, one advantage which is on the memories which are based on structural changes. <clears throat> and it is that when they look at their uh, physics principle behind the switching, they can be quite sure in 99.9% .9 cases that their origin is really structural and not magnetic. However, in our case, when we have these magnetic-based memories, uh, where we think that our functionality relies on changing the magnetic structure, we can be never 100% sure that what we in fact see is an effect of a structural change. Because, you know, magnetism always lives in our devices in some structure. So if you pulse it electrically or if you pulse it optically, you think that you're controlling the magnetic structure, but in fact, something could also happen to the crystal structure of your system. <clears throat> so uh, we have to be always very careful uh, about this. And this is just one example, a uh, very nice example of this antiferromagnetic memory, <clears throat> uh, where uh, uh, you can see that you have this uh, multi-level switching, which you can control back and forth <clears throat> in a device uh, which contains the antiferromagnet. And then there is a reference device in which the antiferromagnet was removed and you just have an allox here. And when you pulse it, you again can control this multi-level switching. And this is just an example showing that sometimes you could ascribe uh, the effect to uh, uh, controlling the antiferromagnetic order, but in fact you might be just controlling a structural uh, order in other parts of your devices, in this particular case in platinum. So, uh, <clears throat> so in this second part, let me now take a look from, uh, uh, from a symmetry perspective on uh, 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 the, the conductivity and what type of uh, conductivity components we should look at and you know, whether we can or cannot really uh, clearly distinguish between magnetic and non-magnetic origin in the switching that we see, the resistive switching that we see. <clears throat> So when we look in, in, in very general terms at conductivity here, we have two components in conductivity tensor. One is the ordinary component and one is the, the Hall component. <clears throat> and the distinction between those two is that the ordinary component is the symmetric uh, conductivity tensor, meaning that uh, this uh, uh, IJ and this JI components are the same here. <clears throat> and the Hall component is the component which is anti-symmetric. So the two uh, off-diagonal components have the opposite sign here. Now, when you combine the symmetry and anti-symmetry uh, property of your two components with Ansarga relations, what you get is that the ordinary uh, conductivity is uh, even under time reversal. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> so if you do time reversal, meaning if you flip your spins, that conductivity uh, component tensor doesn't change sign. But the Hall vector, uh, <clears throat> when again you combine the anti-symmetry with Onsager relation, what you figure out is that it changes sign uh, uh, under time reversal operation. So you have a component which is odd under time reversal. And the second thing to notice is that for the anti-symmetric component, you only have three independent components. You obviously have no diagonal components for the anti-symmetric uh, component of the, of the, of the, of the tensor. So what it means that if you have only three components, you can arrange those three components in a vector, in a three component vector. And that's very important for the symmetry considerations about the Hall effect, that the Hall effect in fact is uh, something like a vector, or if you want uh, more precisely a pseudo vector, a pseudo vector is the type of vector which doesn't change sign under space inversion here. <clears throat> so uh, <clears throat> we have these two. We have the ordinary component, which is even under time reversal, so basically it's insensitive if you reverse the magnetic order. And then you have the whole component, which is very sensitive to when you reverse the magnetic order. So which one would you pick when you want to be sure that what you measure is of magnetic origin? Obviously, you would uh, pick the Hall effect, because that's the one which is really sensitive to the magnetic order. <clears throat> 
but can we do it in antiferromagnets? <clears throat> so uh, let me just pick uh, the simplest representation of a two sublattice collinear antiferromagnet here. So I have, if I have two sublattices, so this would be uh, uh, the two uh, antiferromagnetic moments forming the, the unit cell here, and then I just periodically copy uh, the unit cell of these two antiparallel moments here. So uh, <clears throat> I have my Hall effect for this arrangement, and then I do the time reversal. When I do the time reversal, it means that I just flip all these individual moments here. And when you compare these two, they are different, right? So I just flip the moments, these two uh, lattices look different. So I would expect uh, uh, that I can measure Hall effect, and under time reversal, the Hall effect has to change sign. So this representation would have a plus uh, uh, Hall effect, and this one will have a minus sign here. But the problem is that, look, uh, imagine what, I, what happens when I do a space inversion on this very simple antiferromagnet. So uh, when I do the space inversion around this point here, uh, on, this, on this state here, I get here. I just put this atom here, this atom here, and this is my resulting state. But when you compare this one with the original one, they are the same. But space inversion on a Hall effect does not change sign. It's a, it's a general rule that if you do the space inversion on any linear response, you don't change sign of this coefficient. It's because when you do space inversion on current, you get one minus sign, Sp space inversion on electric field gives you another minus sign, those cancel out, so the, whole co so the conductivity uh, coefficient cannot change sign under space inversion. So I did space inversion here, my Hall coefficient doesn't change sign, but I am here at, at these are the two identical states. So plus Hall has to be the same as minus Hall in this case, Hall must be zero. So in this very simple collinear antiferromagnet, Hall doesn't exist. And there are in fact many of these collinear antiferromagnets which have this property that in fact if you do time reversal and space inversion, you recover the original lattice, magnetic lattice, so they have the so-called PT symmetry. Uh, copper manganese, arsenide, manganese to gold were the uh, materials in which many of the antiferromagnetic spintronics have been performed and they have exactly this uh, property here. So what can we do? The only thing we can do is to use the other component. Uh, this symmetric, the ordinary resistance, because the hall is not available. <clears throat> And so what do you have then at your disposal when you, have, when you just rely on the ordinary even under time reversal component? You can still uh, be able to detect something happening to your magnetic order because obviously when you reorient your magnetic order parameter uh, with respect to your lattice uh, pointing in one direction or pointing in another direction, not by 180 degrees but maybe by 90 degrees, uh, the uh, electronic structure could change and you should be able to, to see some changes in the ordinary conductivity. <clears throat> but there is one necessary condition. The necessary condition is that something has to link the coordinate system of your spins with the coordinate system of your orbital part of your wave function, or that means of your crystal. If these two things are not coupled at all, if you can re rotate your coordinate system of your spins, without noticing it in your crystal uh, part of, uh, uh, of your system, meaning that there is no coupling between the spin and orbital part of your wave function, then uh, you cannot see any difference when you reorient the spins. And typically the strongest coupling between the spin and the orbital part of your wave functions is provided by the Dirac spin orbit coupling, the relativistic spin orbit coupling, but that coupling is typically weak. So it also uh, implies that this anisotropic magnetoresistance typically is not a very strong uh, uh, effect. <clears throat> uh, what we saw already uh, or mentioned that there is another way how we can uh, write information in magnets, in antiferromagnets in particular, and that is changing them from this heavily ordered or let's say single domain state into a heavily disordered multi-domain, multi-domain wall state here. Now, <clears throat> in this case, I am not controlling the net magnetic order vector. I am just changing uh, the, uh, the magnetic order structure here. So I am affecting my order on the level of its exchange interaction because I am really making a magnetic disorder. I am disordering the, uh, the magnetic order. 
and the magnetic exchange is of Coulomb origin, it's very strong. So in this case, uh, you could in principle expect that the changes in the conductivity uh, could be quite large because they would correspond to the strong magnetic Coulomb exchange uh, instead of the weak uh, spin orbit coupling. <clears throat> Uh, but of course, uh, again, an, uh, an, uh, an important check is that this is an ordinary resistance. So if uh, uh, your writing pulses, electrical or optical, uh, did something to the magnetic system, they could have also done something to your structure, uh, to your crystal order structure. And the crystal order structure is also arranged by the Coulomb interaction, by the strong Coulomb interaction. The magnetic order, the crystal order, they both are due to the same Coulomb interaction. So these are also potentially strong effects and they can compete each other. So from here, it is very important not to rely entirely on the electrical uh, resistive signal that you see in these devices, but do an imaging. You have to also look carefully what is the domain, magnetic domain structure by some alternative imaging means to really be more sure that what you observe in the electrical experiments is indeed of magnetic and not of structural uh, origin here. <clears throat> and one of the uh, techniques, and there will be several techniques discussed uh, in this uh, uh, workshop, is to use, uh, <clears throat> to use x ray uh, uh, linear diachroism <coughs> technique. <clears throat> now, linear diachroism, in fact, is an optical or X-ray counterpart of the DC anisotropic magnetoresistance. So you might think I'm not gaining much. Again, it's the same type of principle here where I uh, <coughs> could be misled uh, by structural effects. But the advantage of having this uh, uh, X-ray uh, realization is that I have spectroscopy and I can focus on, uh, on uh, absorption, X-ray absorption edge of specific elements in my structure, in particular on the magnetic elements. And then I am more sure than what I observe is coming from the magnetic part of the crystal and it corresponds really to magnetic domains. And uh, we will see images of uh, corresponding to both this net reorientation of the nail vector in these systems induced by electrical switching or images of this uh, domain fragmentation. But again, uh, this is only one technique and we will see that there are more and maybe uh, <clears throat> also laboratory techniques where uh, uh, this can be done. So in the uh, last uh, five, seven minutes, uh, let me just come back quickly to, uh, to the Hall effect. Maybe we missed something. Uh, maybe we discarded the Hall effect up front uh, too quick. <clears throat> So uh, what do we need for Hall effect? Uh, for Hall effect, what we know from ferromagnets, uh, we thought that we need a net magnetic moment. It was quite natural to think in these terms because a net magnetic moment is also a pseudo vector. And if we have a crystal in which we have this pseudo vector, obviously we can observe a Hall effect, which is also a pseudo vector because these two have the same symmetry behavior and I need to have the time reversal symmetry breaking and all the spatial symmetries that are broken by a pseudo vector being present. But if I have magnetic order, I have such a pseudo vector. So my crystal, magnetic crystal, has all the lowered symmetries that are required for having a non-zero Hall effect. That's fine. But maybe it's not uh, that uh, uh, entirely uh, obvious because <clears throat> Uh, we already saw it in anisotropic magnetoresistance. Imagine that I don't have this link that couples my coordinate systems of the spin with the coordinate system of my orbital wave function of my crystal. Imagine that I have not, no such spin orbit coupling here. <clears throat> and then what it means is that when I do the time reversal, again, my Hall effect should uh, switch sign. But then when I do a 180 degree reorientation of my spins, I just rotate the spins by 180 degrees here. If I don't have any coupling between spin and orbital part, it means that my system uh, is invariant. So I can, uh, uh, or my Hall effect has to be invariant under this pure spin rotation. I have nothing that links in my Hamiltonian spin rotation to the orbital part and my transport is due to the orbital part of the wave function. If nothing links to them, then the Hall effect has to be invariant. So I do the rotation here. Uh, <clears throat> my Hall effect should be uh, uh, invariant here. So I have this plus sign, uh, minus sign, but it cannot depend on this. So Hall effect would be zero. 
So it was the same as in the case of Hall effect being invariant under space inversion. If Hall effect is invariant under rotations in the spin space, uh, it uh, is zero. So what it means is that I need to have, in, for this uh, uh, case, not only the ferromagnetic moment, but I also need to have a spin orbit coupling, something that couples the spin uh, to the lattice uh, so that my Hall effect is not invariant under pure rotation, and in that case, it can be non-zero. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, this was for uh, having all spins in my ferromagnet pointing in one direction. So how about if I align my spins which are uh, in the plane, but they are pointing in different direction. For example, in this triangle antiferromagnet, <coughs> uh, like in this case. So again, if there was no uh, uh, spin orbit coupling, I do the same thing. I do the time reversal, I flip all spins here, and now I can do the rotation of the spins in their spin space by 180 degrees. If I do this, uh, uh, I, you see I recover here the same state, but I have the opposite sign of, uh, um, of the Hall effect. So that's impossible again. So uh, with, without a spin orbit coupling, it doesn't matter whether the spins all are pointing in one direction in a ferromagnet, as long as the spins are in the plane, so that for all these individual spins, I can have a common axis around which I can rotate the spins by 180 degrees here. If I can do this, and if, there is, uh, if my Hall effect is invariant under this pure spin rotation, the Hall effect uh, uh, disappears. So also in this non-collinear state, I need to have a non-collinear but coplanar state, I need to have spin orbit coupling. <clears throat> But, okay, let me bring the spin orbit coupling in, like in a ferromagnet. But what you uh, saw here in this arrangement was that, in fact, this was an antiferromagnet with zero net moment. So the question is, do I need the net moment to have uh, an anomalous Hall effect? And what you see is that because of this non-collinear structure, uh, if I would think of you know, having this PT symmetry, which was killing the Hall effect in the collinear one, so let's take a look. Let's put this point here and try to do the time reversal and the P, and you see that this is now broken because the spins are pointing in different directions. So if I do the space inversion, I cannot, and the time reversal, I do not recover the same state here. So in this case, I do not have this PT symmetry that killed the anomalous Hall effect in the collinear, in the collinear state here. And in fact, I can check that I don't have any symmetry that would kill my Hall effect, even though there is no net magnetic moment. So there are real materials like manganese 3 iridium, which have exactly this arrangement of three fully compensating or nearly fully compensating spin sublattices here. They uh, have no PT symmetry and they have no other uh, symmetry that would kill anomalous Hall effect, so the Hall effect is allowed. So now we have an, uh, an antiferromagnet. It can be a fully compensated antiferromagnet that has anomalous Hall effect. And so finally, let's go back to the original one. Uh, to the two sublattice antiferromagnet. And why I'm coming back to this, because uh, there are a few examples of these three sublattice non-collinear antiferromagnets, but only few. But there is many uh, collinear two sublattice antiferromagnets. And here, uh, 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 the trick is <coughs> that, um, and again, we will hear about that a lot uh, uh, during this conference, is that even with the two sublattice antiferromagnet, you can do well, just this simple uh, trick by adding an atom which is shifted of this uh, PT center of symmetry. You shift this, occupied by an atom, could be non-magnetic, and suddenly you kill the PT symmetry. And then if you kill also all the remaining symmetries that are required for Hall effect, you can have Hall effect even in collinear, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, in collinear antiferromagnets. So, uh, uh, so to summarize now here <coughs> is that uh, uh, in collinear, Ferromagnets or antiferromagnets, uh, we can have this anisotropic magnetoresistance, uh, we can have Hall effect here. But in the collinear systems, all rely on the relativistic uh, uh, spin orbit coupling. <coughs> so you would think that these effects uh, would be always weak. <coughs> well, uh, uh, we will also hear uh, during this conference that this is not always necessarily the case, uh, because if you combine into this physics 
a certain topological effects, if you happen to have topological features in the electronic structure under these uh, symmetry conditions, then these uh, topological effects being having direct fermions or having wild fermions in the systems can actually hugely enhance the magnitude even though you have uh, the effects originating from spin-orbit coupling in these effects. So uh, originally you think that spin-orbit coupling always makes these effects small, and it's really the case in most of the realizations where you have trivial electronic structure, but if you would have topological features in the electronic structure, even these effects uh, can become uh, uh, large. Uh, and another approach how to enhance uh, the resistive readout effect is to rely, instead of the uh, weak spin-orbit coupling, uh, to rely on the much stronger exchange coupling. And we know how to do it in, uh, in these uh, ferromagnetic systems is the giant magnetoresistance, uh, where you, instead of having a single layer magnet, you have uh, two layers, one uh, being a reference and the other one the recording one. And they are also odd under time reversal like Hall effect, but they rely on uh, the exchange coupling. So that's why they can be much stronger than the ordinary or the normal uh, Hall effect. This is very well known for ferromagnets, but now, and there might be some discussions also here during uh, this, this workshop, also this Hall effect containing antiferromagnets in principle can have also spin polarized currents, and with this you can start thinking of making a giant magnetoresistance. And uh, <coughs> uh, on this side here, as already mentioned, another way how to exploit exchange interaction is to break your single domain system in the plane into multi-domains. And if you look at this, in some sense, it is similar to these giant magnetoresistance stacks, only you now create these, these uh, very narrow domain walls instead of the vertical direction, you create them in the horizontal direction in the plane. And that can also uh, potentially lead to high uh, signal, something that will be also discussed in uh, this conference. So thank you very much uh, for your attention.